Um, today we have two panels, and the first one will uh, take off uh, just now. This will be chaired by uh, Nanjala, uh, and they will be looking at new visions, new images, and uh, uh, new stories. You have the program at hand, uh, please. I mean, just follow the uh, events for today through the programs. Once again, uh, I'm very, very pleased to welcome you all back to the second day of the conference. So I'll hand over to Nanjala now. Good morning. How are you doing? Um, thank you all for being here. Um, probably going to get tired of hearing from me, but that's okay. Um, today, I'm really excited about this panel. Um, it's going to be really interesting. We're thinking about um, new ways of imagining, new ways of engaging with information, um, knowledge, um, ideas that are coming from different parts of Africa. And we have a really distinguished panel. Um, we're waiting for one person to join us. Um, and these are all people who are approaching this, the subject matter from completely different perspectives. Some are academics, some are practitioner, um, some are um, actually people in the stream of um, being in the process of developing these new ways of thinking. Um, um, our panelists, I'm just going to really, you have a, a most of the information, but I'm just going to blitz through some of their introductions. Uh, Miriam Paul is a doctoral candidate here at the Africa Department in, at, at SOAS, um, and she focuses on um, the post post-human in contemporary Africa genre fiction, crime, romance, and science fiction. That sounds really exciting. Um, I'm gonna hand over directly to um, Miriam, and um, she's gonna give us her presentation, and then um, I'll ask you to hold off on questions until after we've had all the presentations, and then we'll go um, into your questions and, and engage in that way. Thank you. Thank you, Nanjala, and thank you to the audience for being here for the first panel this morning, and thank you to the organizers uh, for setting up this wonderful conference. Um, my name is Miriam Pahl, I'm a PhD candidate here at SOAS, as Nanjala already said, and in this presentation I look at the interface between, on the one hand, the real-world problem of environmental change, on the other hand, fiction, African literature in general, and African science fiction in particular, and the redefini redefinition of epistemological categories and their relation to each other, in a broader sense, philosophy. I argue in this paper that turning towards African science fiction and its visions of the future will help us to, to develop new approaches to the problems of the environment. Um, a quote by the environmental activist Gus Speth summarizes the relation that I'm going to describe. He says, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address those problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation, and we scientists don't know how to, how to do that. So he differentiates between the underlying causes and symptoms of the problem. He points to the level of self-understanding worldviews and epistemology as the level to approach in order to tackle the problems of the environment. Spes emphasizes the relevance of cultural production and literature as crucial means to change our understanding of, uh, of ourselves, of the human being and its position in the world, in order to achieve the larger objective of changing the course of global environmental processes. To zoom in on, on the particular relevance of science fiction, I turn to Ivor Hartmann, an editor and writer from Zimbabwe, who says about the importance of African science fiction the following. The value of this envisioning of the future for any third world country, or in our case, continent, cannot be overstated nor negated. 
If you can't see and relay an understandable vision of the future, your, your future will be co-opted by someone else's vision, one that will not necessarily have your best interests at heart. So Hartmann points out that envisioning the future is largely in the hands of a rather homogenous collective of Euro-American science fiction writers and thinkers. But in order to create a more inclusive global future, a diversity of voices and visions is indispensable. In other words, I consider African literature not only in the framework of African issues, but as a pertinent contribution to global discourses of how to create the future. <clears throat> um, coming to the epistemology of nature, technology, and the human being, one crucial aspect of the present age of the Anthropocene is that the human being is conceptualized in a position superior to the environment. The widely accepted understanding is that we are in control of our, of our mobile phones, computers, at least most of the time, of our cars, all kinds of, and all ki kinds of technologies that we use in our daily lives. It's a one-way effective relationship. In this conception, the human's ability to develop, use, and control technology is proof and justification of humanity's ethical superiority over other sentient beings and the environment. It elevates the human above animals and nature. This higher ethical standing is created and used to legitimize the subjug subjugation and exploitation of the environment. <clears throat> this this widely accepted understanding of the relation between the human, technology, and, and the environment is gradually contested in African science fiction. One example of this is the novel Dubsteps by the South African author Andrew Miller, who tackles the, the level of the human and technology. The premise of the novel already contests the human's upper hand over technology. Imagine this. All people migrate into virtual reality, and then the system crashes, and literally nobody is left on Earth. This is the post-apocalyptic and very techno-pessimist scenario the main character Roy wakes up to in a deserted Johannesburg, where human re existence is re reduced to a handful of people. The author uses this imagined future microcosm of relationships to examine current social values. He creates a micro-society and emphasizes technological failures of the remaining few human beings. They attempt to build an airplane and they fail. They try to set up a slaughterhouse and they fail. They have difficulties to set up a new Wi-Fi network, etc. And uh, in, this, in this world, technology has grown over the human's head, and human beings are not able to control the high-tech devices anymore. Um, this illustrates what the Ghanaian philosopher Kwasi Wiredu expresses. He says that the real cause of the environmental problem is to be found, I believe, in the fact that technology tends to grow ahead of knowledge, which in turn tends to grow ahead of wisdom and moral virtue. So, he says that the scale of complexity of technology means that it becomes intangible from a perspective of morality and ethics. Technology becomes inhumane. The second point that I want to um, point out about this novel is that it blurs the boundaries between the categories human versus technology. Um, there's a nanobot drug, a sort of elect electronic drug that one drinks to induce into the system of the body. The nanobots in the bloodstream link to the Wi-Fi network and transmit signals from the server to the brain to supersede, to supersede the physical concept, context. They, and they, these erase the concept, conceptual clear distinction between the categories human and technology by integrating technology into the human body. The second example is the, the Binti novella series by Nidhi Okorafor. Nidhi Okorafor reassesses the ways of technology being used to subordinate and exploit the environment. Um, so she tackles the, the level of technology and the environment and their relationship. The, trilogy, the trilogy revolves around Binti, a bold and smart 16-year-old Himba girl who sneaks off from home to accept her place at Umsa University in outer space against the will of her family and her, her conservative culture. The worldview that I described above presents industrialization and technological advancement of any society 
and at the same time their degree of separation from nature as an indicator of that society's degree of civilization. Um, so technolog technologically advanced Western societies are, are opposed to African societies that are generally conceptualized as close to nature. And in short, the more detached from nature a society is and the more technologically advanced, the more is a society perceived as civilized. In the Binti novella series, this conception is revised. The diverging trajectories of technology and the environment are redir redirected and thought together. This com comes through um, in the construction of the Himba tribe, for example. It's a traditional African society modeled on the Namibian ethnic group that you might be familiar with. Um, and the tribe's closeness to nature and the environment is ex expressed in the application of the so-called otise, a mixture of red clay and oil that they apply to their skin. But at the same, at the same time, the tribe is highly technologically skilled and they um, develop devices for communication that the whole world in this, um, in this um, novella series um, relies on. So here, closeness to nature and technological advancement are not mutually exclusive. Also, technologies in this novel series are often inspired by or orientated to, towards natural systems or even using natural systems. Um, examples are all means of transport in the, transport in the, in the novella series, um, lamp plants and undying trees, and Okorafo thinks the two trajectories of technology and environment together and thinks technology through the environment. Um, so, in conclusion, Dubsteps and Binti question the understanding that humans are entirely in control of the technologies they develop. They emphasize the ways technology influence, influence the human in mutually effective relationships. Uh, the novels blur, blur the boundaries between the ontological categories human, technology and environment and thus deconstruct the human's superior position. The two diverging trajectories of technology and, and the, the environment are redirected and thought together. And the two novels are just two examples that demonstrate how African science fiction attempts to counteract the greed, selfishness and apathy that determine how human societies treat the environment and they stimulate a reconceptualization of the relations between the human technology and the environment. Thank you. Thanks, Miriam. Um, next up, we have uh, Dr. John Simpson, who is the British Council's Senior Advisor for English for Sub-Saharan Africa, um, where he provides technical advice in language and education and development and supports the British Council's uh, portfolio in the region. And I think this microphone's a little loud. <laughs> Thank you. John? Morning, everyone. Just like to thank the um, organisers for the invitation to the opportunity to be with you and, and present this morning. Um, I'd just like to, um, f for those of you who may have a particular conception of the council and the work that we do, um, in 2017, the, the type of um, interventions and partnerships that we have are very different from what might have been the case in, say, 1967 or 1987. Um, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where I work, we are involved in a, a Justice for All program in Nigeria, helping the, uh, it's, it's a Nigerian-led reform of the um, justice sector. 
In Ethiopia, we have a civil society program strengthening the capacity of civil society organizations to um, contribute to national development, poverty reduction, and, and, good, and good governance. Um, my own work in language and education is very much ev evidence-led. Um, so we work across the region partnering with governments we, at, at level of, of both policy and, and practice. And of course, we are very committed to um, uh, multilingual education and we see the space in which English operates as very much within a plurilingual um, society and, and education system. So that's, as it were, uh, where, where we're coming from on this. Um, and the title of my talk, uh, brief presentation this morning is Heightened Linguistic Diversity in African Classrooms, the Challenge to Inclusive Education. Two starting points for that, really. Picking up on a couple of threads from yesterday, uh, Lutz is one of Lutz's conclusions that um, language um, problems, as it were, uh, underline the sort of suboptimal performance in universal education. So I want to drill down a little bit and look at some of the reasons why we still have a, a lot of issues around uh, language and learning, uh, learning outcomes. And the second one is linked to um, Anya Katcher's reference to his mention of the huge demographic bulge currently and this single biggest shift which is occurring presently across the region, which is the rural um, urban migration. And uh, one likely uh, effect of that will be heightened linguistic diversity, particularly in, in urban classrooms. So the question is, how do we actually get to uh, multilingual solutions to multilingual realities and uh, where that challenge is actually uh, growing uh, day by day? So um, that I think is a, is, is, is a, is a given, if you like. Uh, Africa is known as one of the most uh, plurilingual re regions of the world. Um, what's of interest, I think, is, is looking at the process through which some of these multilingual realities, this is an inverted um, pyramid then, get filtered out or funneled, if you like, um, so we start with a huge and diverse and enormously rich asset in terms of linguistic diversity. Um, that then gets sort of filtered out in a number of ways. One of it is, of course, through um, countries' constitutions and their uh, uh, national language policies, which, which designate sometimes a national language, in other cases both a national language and a small number of, of official languages. And they, of course then become uh, valorized, if you like, and that starts to, that, that obviously clearly reinforces the sense of hi hi hierarchy of languages uh, operating. Um, and Kenneth mentioned yesterday in Zambia, I think he said there were seven languages there which have been um, recognized for use in, in education. Ghana, I think, has a list of 11 languages, but this is out of maybe 60, 70, 80 languages across the, you know, across the country. So, Again, we have that sort of filtering out effect where um, a relatively small number of languages are designated for use in informal education. If we come down a, a tier further then, what we, what we see is that many education systems operate in, in a bilingual mode. That's to say there are two languages of learning and teaching which operate se sequentially. Very often you'll find um, an, an indigenous language which is used in the early years of education, and then a, a switch to a European language, usually fairly early on, perhaps after lower primary, that may be the switch to English, French, or, or Portuguese. And that's very much a transitional sort of um, bilingual uh, model. It's not really looking to maintain uh, the local or familiar language, but, but move as quickly as possible to European language. And we know just how devastating that is in terms of uh, learning outcomes and its contribution to repetition and, and dropout rates um, within the system. Kids, clearly, if they're not understanding the language of the classroom, then they're not really able to engage or make a great deal of meaning from what's going on around them. Now, not only do we have that sort of um, system operating, but in, some, in many respects also, uh, we find a monolingual classroom policy uh, adopted by um, senior education officials. Essentially what that means is that at any one time, 
um, in the classroom. Only one language of learning and teaching is permitted. So to give an example in Rwanda, where I happen to be based, um, Kinyarwanda is the language of learning and teaching for P1 to P3. That then shifts to English in P4. So children learn all subjects across the curriculum in English, or they're expected to, uh, without any further use of Kinyarwanda. So there's no real uh, attempt to uh, facilitate the transfer or the, the coding of all knowledge and skills that have taken place in the mother tongue in P1 to 3 uh, in, into English in P4. There's a huge kind of gap, uh, a chasm um, emerges there. And of course, we know in practice that teachers do use Kinyarwanda in the classroom to try to bridge that gap. But of course, that creates the policy creates a sort of a guilt complex because peach, uh, teachers don't feel comfortable using the, the home language since it's not sanctioned uh, by government. So those are just some of the uh, ongoing issues there. So this is in fact what happens then um, in the monolingual um, classrooms. And I say that transition happens at a very early stage before children are actually ready to, 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 to learn through the medium of English or a language which is different from their own. Um, the expert estimates are it takes between about six and eight years to develop fluency in what we call cognitive and academic language proficiency. That's the kind of genre, if you like, which supports learning in formal education. So it's not, it's not everyday English, it's not playground English. It's a very specific register of the language that's needed to support learning and, and, and acquisition of that to a degree which will sustain uh, learning takes at least six to eight years. But many children uh, of many education systems are uh, transiting kids after only two or three years of you know, quite uneven quality of teaching of English as a subject. So it simply uh, doesn't really support uh, their learning. So then English medium education, we could say the same about French or, or Portuguese, is both, creates both a, a heavy load for learners uh, and for teachers and contributes really to fairly high levels of repetition uh, and dropout. Now, um, when we talk with some uh, officials uh, in Ministry of Education and ask them for the reason for this monolingual classroom policy, um, some of the responses we receive are along the lines of, well, it would simply be too confusing for children if we were to allow more than one language to operate uh, in the classroom. Uh, another reason commonly cited is that, well, if we allow teachers to maintain the use of the home language of familiar language, then they will never move to teaching in English. Um, uh, a third reason often cited is, well, uh, that's how we were taught, and uh, learners should just, uh, you know, that it's the no, the no pain, no gain kind of school of thought on this. Um, and it very much reflects a, a sort of um, an, a, a, an attitude that if it was good enough for us and we survived and we learned, uh, then it's, it's okay for present day learners. It's the notion of um, elite closure, I think, comes in here very much, which is the um, you know, um, senior officials perpetuating a system which uh, favors a minority of children, but at the expense of the vast majority of learners who simply, you know, um, it, it, it's not appropriate for. Um, Carol Benson here, who some of you will know as a, a leading figure in um, international research on language and education, uh, uh, points to one of the reasons for this being the conflation uh, of national language policy and language and education policy. And uh, <coughs> she poses the question here uh, that you'll see at the top of the slide. Um, and she claims there's a sort of a leakage going on here that the national language policy, which is about sort of economic development, creating a, the nation state, as it were, trying to preserve the fabric of what is often a very linguistically and ethnically diverse uh, nation. Uh, that dictates national language policy, but then there isn't really a segregation or a separation of that from um, educational language policy. That sort of uh, filters in or leaks into educational language decisions, which are not always in the best interests of um, learning and, and, and uh, achievement. So her argument is that educational language decisions must be brought into the realm of, of pedagogy. What are the choices of language of learning that best support 
um, success in, uh, in education. Um, what I'm suggesting is that there are actually a couple of opposing forces at work here. Um, I think to help explain the uh, government's degree of tolerance, if that's the appropriate word, of local languages to a degree in the early years of formal education, we could say that there, is a, there are centrifugal forces at work here, pushing things away from the center and allowing a degree of flexibility and openness uh, and, and inclusivity, but only to a degree, as we saw yesterday from Zambia, we know in Ghana uh, uh, and in other countries, it's usually only a, a relatively small number of the total uh, number of languages that are found in a country which are actually um, sanctioned for use in education. Then what tends to happen uh, after the early years is that the, the centripetal forces come into play, pulling things back towards the center and, and valorizing uh, often the, <coughs> the European language, the official language, uh, or the national language. So I think we, we, this is a tension which continues, something that we need really uh, to address. Um, this is just to share with you an insight from a, a recent piece of work we commissioned through uh, Beth Erling and her team at the Open University. We asked them to go and investigate issues of medium of instruction in Ghana and, and India and to come and, and, and report back. And this is really just one of the um, uh, findings from that study which will be presented at the um, UCFIT conference in September um, at Oxford. Um, and we also, by the way, are convening our own uh, language and development conference in November in Dakar in, in Senegal. And uh, if you just Google on 2017 language and development conference or speak with me afterwards, I'll be very happy to share with you some further information about that. So um, this really is looking at perceptions, particularly amongst uh, parents and communities. And this links obviously to the notion of the uh, hierarchy of languages and the degree to which that sort of uh, notion is still very prevalent in people's minds and influencing uh, their decisions. So um, their conclusion really is that uh, unless some of these uh, strategies are developed to counter these perceptions, the, they, theirs is a rather pessimistic prognosis in terms of English likely to remain the dominant language of primary education. So that, if you like, does link to, to Swan's notion of the, the hierarchy of languages. Um, also to, this is an, an application of that model in David Gradle's work, 2010. The idea being that um, when uh, parents or children add a further language to their repertoire, it tends to be one of the language, they tend to want to move up the hierarchy because of the perceived uh, gateway sort of uh, forces at work, uh, accessing uh, education, economic opportunities, etc. Now that's not always the case, there are horizontal choices to be made, but um, that's kind of the argument that's often presented uh, from this perspective. So that's David, uh, well, De, De Swan uh, produced the theory, and then the application was by uh, David Gradle in his book, Looking at the Future of English, which was something we commissioned in uh, 2010. So um, really just a quick sort of um, few words on, many of you I think will be familiar with this 2010 report from the UN Habitat on the state of African cities. And so this, this links to what we heard yesterday about the huge um, shift going on in terms of urbanization uh, and um, the likely heightened linguistic diversity that's uh, taking place across the continent, really, from this shift from rural to urban. And really, in terms, in terms of planning, planning for not just the delivery of basic education services, but also health, um, access to justice, uh, any public service, really, uh, governments are going to need to look very closely at the effects of this huge kind of um, internal migration which is going on. And, and um, this is actually taking place already, and you'll see by 20, what is it, by 2030, there'll be 
roughly equal numbers of people living in urban and rural areas, but by 2050, uh, there'll be about 50% more uh, people living in urban. So that's an enormous uh, transformation, and it requires some very concentrated planning and effort, uh, particularly around the idea of um, plurilingualism and inclusion and equitable uh, access to quality services. Um, so one way in which that I think can be addressed is through uh, linguistic landscape analysis or what's com commonly referred to as language mapping. This is just an interesting example of something coming out of the 2011 census here, looking at most commonly spoken languages in London, um, excluding English. You can see the kind of the clustering effect there. And so this is uh, linguistic landscape analysis or language mapping is something which is currently beginning to happen in parts, in, in pockets of sub-Saharan Africa. We've seen it in places like Mali, um, Ghana, and uh, Ethiopia. Um, this is a uh, result of one which was carried out in, in, in Mopti, in Mali, under a USAID program across almost 1,000 schools. And um, what was interesting here is that um, about four languages, the ones in Burgundy, Dogon, Pool, Bambara, and Bozo, were seen to be um, a common language for in over 90% of the schools. And by common language, they mean simply a language that pupils use amongst themselves to communicate um, regularly. So this is not exactly what one might call, um, it's, 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 it's a step forward, we might say, but it's by no means the plurilingual. Um, uh, it's looking for commonalities, if you like, and clustering rather than equity or inclusion across all the languages. But it's, it's an example of the kinds of accommodations which are currently being made through um, language mapping. Uh, so really what I want to conclude by saying is that um, language which is often considered to be a hidden factor in education and society is actually a hugely important issue when it comes to inclusion. And it's often overlooked in the inclusive education agenda, which is often about other, other, other things, which are obviously also enormously important. But I think we overlook language uh, at our peril in terms of being both in inclusive and equitable notion. Um, I'm a little bit optimistic on this one insofar as um, SDG4, um, you know, uh, in, in ensure, ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education, that, that sustainable development goal actually creates a space for language to be investigated as an inclusive and equitable education issue. So I'm hopeful that over the next uh, 10 to 15 years, we will actually start to see some of these very long-standing uh, language issues addressed, and hopefully we'll start to see actually children being given much more opportunity to learn and to succeed in a language which they're much more familiar with and comfortable in than a, a European one. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Um, we're going to move straight into the next presentation. Um, this is from Judy Kibinga. Judy is a Kenyan filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, um, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about her experience. This is more of a practitioner approach to um, setting up this uh, new way of telling stories in Kenya. Well, not new, but certainly um, innovative way of uh, telling stories in uh, East Africa. So over to you, Judy. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's fantastic to be here uh, sharing what has become a real passion. Um, the DocuBox of the East African Documentary Film Fund is an organization that um, I founded about four years ago and rapidly got some colleagues in who became part of what is really becoming a very important 
journey. Um, DocuBox are the only documentary film fund in East Africa, and the whole reason why we exist is to support um, emerging documentary filmmakers, East African artists who are accountable, who are talented, and we support them through training, we support them through mentoring, but most importantly, something that I've heard echoed again and again in different talks, we support each other, I'm a filmmaker myself, by building a sense of confidence and community amongst ourselves. Um, we support, you know, in, in a lot of African countries, in Kenya in particular, across East Africa, when we think about documentaries, we roll our eyes and we just think, oh, those boring educational things that come on TV at 9 p.m. or that we're forced to watch in school. We don't really think about documentaries as creative or intimate or independent or observational. We don't think about the characters who tell our much larger story through them and through their lives. So what we look for are films that uncover realities um, because they're authored by authentic local voices that offer viewers just new perspectives. And, and what does that mean? If you, you know, have sort of written on the continent or, or watch telly on the continent, you'll notice again and again that our stories are often told by the other. And in many ways, you know, that's fine. We need a collection of different perspectives into who we are and where we're going, but where are our stories? Is it only the perspective of the other that we have on ourselves? And, and that's really why DocuBox has been founded, to find those local voices um, and to learn together how to, how to author stories with, with new perspectives. Oops. Okay, so where did it begin? Um, this journey, I, I was never supposed to run a film fund. In fact, when it was first suggested, or I, I almost, actually I was almost sick. <laughs> because as a filmmaker, you know, to me, it's, it's you look for funds, you don't start a fund. That is complicated. That is something that other people in other countries do. Oh my goodness, a fund. You know, I was paralyzed at the thought. But when I really looked at things, I realized that in my own career, I'd been paralyzed in so many ways. Uh, I worked on a film called Scarred, The Anatomy of a Massacre, which told the story of a massacre that had happened in Kenya 30 years before. And I had opened up a newspaper and I'd read about this story where 5,000 men were herded onto an airfield in northern Kenya and systematically slaughtered by our government. And I didn't really know how to make, you know, being a fictional filmmaker who'd made shorter documentary films, I didn't really know how to make a longer or feature-length documentary film. Um, but Wagala really made me realize how lonely that process was. And, and as the fifth year checked in and the film launched, I just thought nobody should have to do this kind of thing um, without some, you know, without some sense of, of community and support. So simultaneously, I was um, in the middle of, of creating, at the request of the Ford Foundation, a kind of framework for how a documentary film, make, uh, f film fund would work. And, and that whole process um, helped me really question what it was that, that we needed, what I would need to have a better experience, um, how we'd be able to get more people making more stories just like ours. So, Okay, our manifesto. Everything starts with a good little document. Blah, blah, blah. We can do blah, blah, fish cake. So, so I'm putting this up so that you can help me be the judge at the end of this little talk and tell me if you feel that the things we've done over the, the last few years have kind of answered what began as a very theoretical manifesto. And I'll just jump out at the red words, um, which kind of summarize the whole. We set out by saying that we believed that doc good documentaries were films that would be able to uncover new realities because they were personalized glimpses into worlds, issues, and lives that challenged ideas and assumptions. And we further stated that we believed that we needed to support films that would make the world a better place. Makes you almost want to kumbaya, hold hands. But is, is it possible? I don't know. Let's see. So. Four years on, we have actually put um, a lot of support into about 24 films. Um, after this very long journey, we have um, these five films, almost six uh, uh, completed. They'll be completed by the end of the year. They are really diverse stories. 
a little later, those of you who are here in the evening will, will actually will see a trailer when Lindy and I speak um, in the evening that, that actually give us a glimpse of all, all of these different films. So films that are as diverse as uh, Truck Mama, the story of a trucker who's a, a, a woman who drives all the way to Sudan and yet is struggling to be a mother. Um, the Delaya, a story that began uh, about the port in Lamu and really ended up being about the filmmaker converting and becoming a, a Muslim in the process and what that meant and who she was and very layered. Um, Truth, a, a story about um, a, a group of gay friends who live in one of the continent's largest slums, Madare, and, and, and just uh, you know, for four years, a film that follows the, the way they live and, and asks the question, why can't we be al allowed to love the people that we love? So each of these films, really painstaking, each of them a long four-year process, but I think un unlike my experience, one that is supported by, um, by, like, by like minds. So how do we do it? We make an open call, uh, we have a panel, we select projects, we go through teaser development. Uh, I think, you know, just to, to emphasize again why I suppose I'm even bothering to share the process, you know, as I was sort of walking through, so as I was thinking, you know, it's so amazing that there are all these institutions and, you know, if you want to go and do a master's or a PhD, you, you, there's a process and, and, and along with colleagues who are studying different things, you get to understand the process. I think it's very different being, um, a filmmaker on the continent, we just get up and go. We're just like, film, yeah, no problem. <laughs> you know, some of us have been lucky to go to film school. I wasn't. Um, many people have gone to film school. Thank goodness for YouTube. Um, that is the new film school. But, but there is a way that things are made. There is, you know, filmmaking is not just a talent. It's a craft. And if you're raising money for a documentary and you want to tell that, that all-important Kenyan story or African story, and you want to pitch, you, you need to have a trailer. And we, we don't, we didn't really, many of us, at least um, a lot of the, the majority of the filmmakers who we work with didn't realize that, just as I hadn't realized it. And so we go through all the different steps. We competitively award production grants, we uh, give master classes, and we look um, to just empower talent that have powerful stories that need telling. So in our first round of grants, we, su we supported six films. On the second round, another six. Uh, in all, in the last four years, with uh, money's fund raise, I've, I've learned to be a fundraiser. Ooh, you know, I've sort of just gotten over the, the terror of doing that. Um, but I think it makes it easier to ask if you're asking for others. And so we've managed to, to give over $250,000 worth of uh, funding and, and grants. Um, we've managed to put a whole lot more into mentorship and training as well. Um, and this has led to all kinds of wonderful things because much as we love to and need to tell our own stories, we are part of the world. We are part of a, a larger global village. And one of the events that we had that was super exciting and, and, and that literally began to harness the power of documentary and share it with others was the good pitch. And this is an event uh, that brings together documentary filmmakers with foundations and NGOs and campaigners and philanthropists and governments. And we forge coalitions around films. Um, so literally, it was a day in which we found six amazing films, some were ours, put them on a stage, and created partnerships around each one. And this is really important because, you know, sometimes uh, you'll have a film, uh, for instance, like The Letter, which is in a sense about witchcraft along the coast, but that goes much deeper and discovers that the persecution of um, the 30 or so elderly people that are killed on Kenya's coast, coast every single month uh, is, is more about economic empowerment. It's about a generation trying to take, the, take land from their grandpa grandparents because they feel uh, disabled. And so fine, you make a story like that, but if you are not connected to institutes of learning along the coast, how does this film get passed on to the younger generation? If you aren't connected to the churches along the coast that are 
you know, taking these, these elders and, and forcefully um, having exorcisms, then how do you convince the church that they need to be part of this movement? And so we begin to look at films not just as um, a wonderful expression of creativity, but a real powerful tool that can change the continent that we live in, that can actually, without preaching and through characters that we have carefully followed and filmed for years, um, we can take these little gems to, to organizations like Help the Aged and say, look what we have, help us change things with this film. And that's what The Good Pitch uh, was doing. And that's kind of just a little glimpse. I don't know if you can see it much, um, but just this whole hall filled with people, um, the filmmakers shaking knees at the top of the table, a whole coalition of amazing partners, universities, ministry, government. Um, in this case, you know, we had truth, the filmmakers shared their amazing trailer, talked about what they needed from the room, really carefully curated crowd um, or audience, and got the support they needed to, you know, they got support to finish the film, they got buy-in from LGBTQI communities across East Africa, and so that day um, is, is one of the things and one of the ways that DocuBox is really trying to, to say, to change the way, oops, am I running late? No, no, no. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I get carried away sometimes. I saw you looking at your watch. <laughs> okay, so that, you know, so it's a powerful day. So I think DocuBox initially, much as it began as this um, sort of fairly lonely struggle and looking up and recognizing other independent filmmakers like myself were struggling, it's slowly over time growing to become something um, something larger and something that encompasses not just our creative community, but a community of people who, who really value and understand the importance of stories well told. So that was the registration day um, at the National Museum. So in that single day, we were able to, to, to raise from the audience um, collectively over $100,000. We were able to, to really connect um, people to, to, to partners that they wouldn't have imagined being connected to. Uh, and to really, I think, create for, the first, or, or create for the first time a real buzz around documentary film. And a lot of people just sort of waking up was the feeling and thinking, what? You mean documentary can be gripping and engaging and important? Um, yes, it can. <laughs> So the documentary film screenings that we have every month um, are different from the good pitch, different from what I've, um, the things we've talked about previously. We realized along the way as well, we began with having monthly screenings for filmmakers. And we realized that um, one thing that we needed to do was really build documentary audiences around what we were doing. And so every single month we, um, well, not every single month. We have, we have seasons around films. We go to high schools, we go to campuses, and I'll just show you a couple of pictures just from last month um, around a film that we took around the country. Uh, we have our elections in Kenya on August the 8th, and we thought it was really important to take a film, not one that we had made, um, but a documentary film that, that got students really thinking about the upcoming elections, a film actually about three kids in a, in a school in Kenya running to, to try and be head boy or head girl. Um, and, and through their campaign, uh, we see these kids engaging in, in all the things that we see our own politicians, uh, sexism, you know, the, the girls in the school turning against the young girl who's running and saying, you know, how can a girl run? You know, how is this possible? One of the wealthier boys trying to, to tell people, if you vote for me, I'll slaughter a goat for the whole school at the end. And, um, <laughs> and just all these various ways of, of, of corruption that already are bubbling up in our young. And so we took this film around, and as you can see, the, the crowds were, were huge. Um, and and that, these are the audiences that we're building for the future. And at the end of a film like that, you're able to tell kids to look at each other and to hold hands and say, you know, whatever, to make peace pledges. Whatever happens after August the 8th, you will still be my sister. You will still be my brother. And, and that's the beauty of documentary. It allows you to have conversations because you are hooked in by a, diff, a character's journey and you can suddenly relate that to your own life. And through that, you can change things. Um, we've also been um, showing a, a film that we supported during the Good Pitch called Thank You for the Rain. And again, in these Trump times, there's so much debate around uh, global warming and, 
and, um, and about the different things that are happening in different countries. And we thank you for the rain. Um, there was a farmer, a very simple but amazing community leader called Kisilu, whose land is being completely ravaged by, um, by climate change. And in Thank You for the Rain, the filmmakers, he became one of the filmmakers himself, uh, began to shoot on his phone, began to shoot on a little camera that his uh, Norwegian co-director gave him. And six years later, they had this powerful film. And again, DocuBox is part of our outreach, as part of the conversations that we, we want to promote, even as we create films. We took this film out to Mutumo. We took it to his home area. And hundreds and hundreds of farmers turned up and really began to clamor f uh, to see this film. A lot of word of mouth, a lot of discussion about new techniques. Um, and to be able to see the star of the film, Kisilu, there talking to them about his, his methods, things that they had seen in the film, really bring to life um, all these things that, that can be very, very theoretical. So I'll just go quickly over this. We are also at, um, building a community of filmmakers who collaborate, very, very important for us. We are physically building um, a space. It's not a huge space, but it's, it's, it's about three or four rooms. Uh, where we hope to experiment, um, to invite filmmakers to find a home, to be able to, to discuss between us what's important, what do we need to be making next? Um, how do you need support? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Where's your film? Can we hold it up? And can we look at it? And can we criticize it? Uh, one of the things we found, at least amongst ourselves as, as, um, as Kenyan and East African filmmakers, is, is we're really hurt by criticism. We don't realize that it is part, it is essential to creativity. It is essential to the development of, um, of, a, of a product, of a film. And so I think, you know, it's a rigorous debate around films, those that we are making and those that others have made, um, that will be happening at the Hub. And we have workshops, we've done a whole bunch of um, online content. Uh, we have edit suites as well. Um, and I think it was, it's just worth sharing here. What about the box in, in academia? What about um, the box as a place where a whole bunch of filmmakers who are already collaborating are able to, to think through the things that perhaps a professor teaching African studies in a university in the States might need some visual tools or a short documentary to bring their work alive. Uh, so those are the kind of things that we are beginning to explore as, as we go forward. Um, so to summarize, we kind of have a logic within DocuBox that we've developed, and that is that we support uh, the people who make the documentaries, documentaries bring the audience, the audience creates the impact, the impact creates the change. Um, and that, you know, finally we have the change that we all seek. So that's it. I hope that this lived up to the manifesto that uh, I showed at the beginning, and you can see how perhaps we are beginning to change things a little bit through film. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, I have to sort of, whenever I see Judy, I always take a minute to just shout out uh, her film, Scarred. Um, two years ago, we founded a festival in, in Kenya called the Somali Heritage Week, um, which was about raising awareness about Somali uh, culture and how, um, I, I can't call it xenophobia because Somalis are Kenyans, but there's a, a certain animus that exists with the broader society against Somali people. And we showed Judy's film, Scarred, and the response was tremendous. Um, people were crying in the audience and we got uh, demands that we had to screen it again, so we had to move the festival calendar around so we could make time to see it again. So if you ever see Scarred playing at a place near you, please uh, make time to see it. Um, up next, we have Dr. Luisa Ebunike. Did I say that correctly? Yes. Um, who is a lecturer in English at Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, and she is currently working on a project about the legacies of the Biafra, Biafra, Biafra? Biafra. Biafra. <laughs> Biafra. Do you know what, honestly, in my entire life, I've never known how to say that. You know, it's one of those words that you see and you never actually have to say out loud. 
um, Biafra War. So, Louisa. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so yes, I'm Louisa. I did my PhD here at SOAS um, a few years ago, and I also work with CAS in organizing the annual Igbo conference here at SOAS. So if anyone's interested about the Igbo conference, you can come and see me in the break. We recently had um, a conference here at SOAS, Legacies of Biafra, to mark the 50th anniversary of the Nigeria-Biafra War. But today, I'm here to talk to you about um, Nigerian Literature in Focus, Writing Nigeria Through a New Lens. This is a very big subject for 10 minutes, so I will do my best, um, and I will sort of use brief examples. I can't expand and speak to its entirety, so apologies if, if I sort of breeze over very large subjects. Um, I've got new in uh, scare quotes because there is nothing new under the sun. So there, it's a, a new lens in a sense. There's elements that are new, but there are elements that are very much embedded in Nigerian uh, literary culture. So I'll speak to that. So like uh, Miriam, I'm speaking about Nedia Okorafor. Uh, so she is the new lens, <laughs> or she writes literature through a new lens is what I'm, I'm positing. Um, and I just wanted to sort of frame uh, her work uh, using this quote. And she speaks about her, the, the way in which she writes and her approach to writing, and she calls her literature organic fantasy, the idea that her fantasy literature really comes from the soil. It's not something external. It's very much intrinsic to who she is. She says, the fantasy that I write is far more than what is on the surface. I am not just making stuff up. There is a method, purpose, and realness to my madness. It is not fantasy for fantasy's sake, as so many reviewers have speculated. And this term, fantasy for fantasy's sake, is an echoing of Chinua Achebe's famous quote, and I can swear because Achebe said it, not me, and Achebe says that art for art's sake is, like, is just another piece of deodorized dog shit. <laughs> so the idea that literature, art, has a particular social function is something that um, Okorafor is also stating in her literature. Although she's writing fantasy, she's saying it has a particular purpose. And so part of what I want to do is insert Nedia Okorafor's work into an existing Nigerian literary tradition. I should say uh, Nedia Okorafor describes herself as a Niger-American writer. So she's of the Nigerian diaspora, living in America, but very much her work writes about Africa. And actually, what's interesting about her literature is she very much centers Africa. So she envisions a future. She engages in you know, sci-fi fantasy uh, literature. She writes sci-fi fantasy literature, um, which is sometimes often described as Afrofuturist literature. But it centers Africa. So as we're talking about futures at this conference, I just want to make the point that Okorafor's future, um, or Okorafor views the future through Africa, Africa is centered. So we're probably used to seeing these end of world narratives where you know, some young, beautiful Americans are running around trying to save the day. Um, Okorafor's version of that is young, beautiful Nigerians running around trying to save the day. So it's kind of, a, 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 again, a new lens in terms of futurity in the world. Okay. So I'm not going to get into the debates around terminology, but I wanted to sort of make you aware of this idea of Afrofuturism, and I think we'll speak a bit more about this over the course of this conference. But this is a quote from Kodre Shun, who says, Afrofuturism does not stop at correcting the history of the future, nor is it a simple matter of inserting more black actors into science fiction narratives. These methods are only baby steps towards the more totalizing realization that in Greg Tate's formulation, Afro-diasporic subjects have lived the estrangement that science fiction writers envision. Black existence and science fiction are one and the same. Now, this notion of sort of Afro-futurist literature is often associated with African-American literature. And the idea that this sort of history of um, Africans in America, if we think about that history, it reads like a sort of sci-fi novel. Think about you know, abduction, um, enslavement, the Middle Passage, and, um, and life in, in the Americas. And it can read like a kind of alien abduction novel. I mean, you can think about um, 
the conditions under which um, African Americans lived and existed. Um, and you can see that science fiction is a, is a lens through which to in, investigate and explore this history. But what we've been seeing in recent years is um, African writers and artists um, actually engaging in the writing of uh, science fiction fantasy and exploring issues like colonization, for example, through this Afrofuturist lens. And that leads me to my next slide. This is something that Okorofa has, has said about um, the seminal text, Things Fall Apart. I have always read Things Fall Apart as an alien invasion novel. So although I'm talking about um, writing and using a new lens in writing, I just wanted to sort of nod to the fact that there's also ways of rereading the African literary canon and using her Afrofuturist lens to reread the, the novels that we're probably all now quite familiar with. And so that kind of shapes and frames things fall apart in, in a very different way. Um, and it also goes to show that Okorafor's writing isn't out of step with uh, existing literatures in, uh, from Nigeria. And this is the point I want to make um, and discuss very, very briefly her novel, Lagoon. This is a quick summary of the novel, but essentially it's an alien invasion novel uh, set in Lagos and we meet a range of characters. Uh, and one of the central characters is Ayodele, who is um, this figure who emerges from the water. She's an alien, she's a shapeshifter. And we follow them, we follow the narrative, and we follow them as they try to um, uh, sort of um, bring, about, bring about change in the nation. And there's key environmental concerns in this novel. The novel opens with um, looking at the life of fish underwater um, in, sort of the, in, the, uh, in the sea by Bar Beach. So the fact that Okorafor centers her novel or begins her novel in the sea puts forward the importance of um, our environment. And this is something that continues through the novel, the idea of, uh, of, of pollution and the impact it has on, our, on, on ourselves and on our communities. And it's a central feature of the novel. But I don't want to go too much into this because, again, uh, 10 minutes isn't a long time. Okay, so that will, hopefully this will make sense. I'll kind of come back to that figure of Ayodele, but I wanted to talk briefly about a couple of texts that I, I read as part of the, um, the histories, of the sort of literary histories that Okorafor engages in and with. And one of these texts is Florin Wapa's Efru, which was published in 1966. And this is a novel that looks at the lives of, or the life of a particular woman in an Igbo community um, in the southeast of, of what is now modern-day Nigeria in, during the colonial period. And one of the central figures in this novel is um, Uhamiri, the goddess of the lake. And we see how the goddess of the lake is very important to the lived experience of the people within this community. So the goddess of the lake is revered. The goddess of the lake um, is prayed to, is worshipped by a, a community of women. And she, um, she very much looks after this community of women who worship her and the community at large. But there's this revealment for the goddess of the lake that I want to suggest also links to this deep respect that is held for the environment. So you cannot... Um, you cannot sort of pollute this lake because in polluting the lake, it's also not only will it affect the community who make use of this lake, but it's also an abomination, right? So it has this idea of pollution is very much linked to the spiritual. And so to pollute this lake is very much an abomination because it's a disrespect to this goddess. And so there's this environmental element in the sort of the cosmologies of these communities that although it isn't articulated explicitly, in these texts, it's very much present. And I think this is something that Okorofo is tapping into when she's writing her contemporary narrative of um, Lagoon. Now, if Ephra is, is very much sort of a realist, so to speak, realist text, also Okorofo is drawing on an existing sort of speculative fiction literary tradition that exists within Nigeria, an example being um, Amos Tutuola's The Palm Wine Drinkard, published in 1952. And this, no this novel, the synopsis of it is there's a, a, a the protagonist, the main character, uh, loves palm wine. His palm wine tapper dies, and the novel shows his journey, you know, into the sort of spirit world to try and find his tapper so that he can continue to drink palm wine. 
and we sort of meet all these different spirits along the way. He goes into these different communities and realms, and we see him um, gradually progress. But this is the central premise of the text. It's this journey to, to the spirit realm to find um, his palm wine tapper, who's, who's now... Tapa, who's now passed away. So Okorof is also drawing on this existing tradition of the speculative, of the spiritual, and it's um, incorporated into this narrative. So this isn't something that's purely an external. This isn't uh, a, a, an American writer who's read lots of sci-fi and now is sort of imposing it onto an African setting. She's also drawing very much on existing traditions within Nigeria. But she was also drawing on African-American literary tradition. And she, she mentions that in many of her interviews that Octavia Butler, who's an African-American writer and writes science fiction, um, is very much an influence to her. So one of those texts that has influenced Nedia Okorofor is Wild Seed. And again, this is a novel about a shapeshifter, about a woman, actually, who is born in an Igbo village and is captured or is coerced into traveling to the US um, or what is now the US, traveling to the Americas. And she becomes um, at the mercy of central figure Doro. But she's this shape-shifting woman um, who, of Igbo heritage. And you can see why this novel, to an extent, would also appeal to Nedia Okorafor, because it's located in part of the world that a lot of her works are located in, but then covers, this, covers the Middle Passage and um, speaks to an, an African-American experience. And so we have, again, in Lagoon, uh, referencing of sort of shape-shifting central character to female and the powers that that woman yields. And so, okay, so yes, I am, I'm making some big jumps. I hope you're all still with me. I hope this is making sense. Is it making sense? Perfect. Okay. So, I spoke a bit about Eferu and um, Uhammiri, the woman of the lake, across West Africa and Central Africa. These goddesses of, of various water bodies are often referred to in sort of generic terms as mummy water. So this is, what, this is how we could also frame Uhammiri. Um, and one critic has framed Ayodele in um, Nedia Korofa's lagoon as a kind of mummy water figure who emerges from the water again, who's, who's, who, has, who wields this kind of power and influence within the community that she's in. Um, and this, this is just an excerpt from a, a piece that's online that sort of speaks to uh, that mummy water framework uh, that exists within Okorafor's writing. Um, you can read it. I won't read it out to you. But again, the, the point that I want to make, or the point that I want to drive home, is that Okorafor is writing out of an existing literary tradition. She's drawing upon existing frameworks. She's drawing upon elements of, of sort of the fo folklore, elements of the existing spiritual, uh, cosmological um, belief systems, but she's also rereading them and placing them in a new framework, looking, looking at them through the framework of science fiction. Um, but also making some important points around the environment, which already existed within the literature um, of Nigeria. Um, when I was speaking about the palm wine drinker, I should have said one of the, one of the elements in, or one of the aspects of um, Lagoon that speaks to Tutuola's work is there is a section where she showcases the um, Lagos Benin um, um, that's sort of the main thoroughfare, the main road there. And it's a road that is known to have many accidents and many fatalities. And she characterizes this road as having a, a monster that resides within it, that essentially is kind of eating up the people on the road. So again, it's, it's engaging with current concerns and conditions. Um, it's drawing upon existing folkloric uh, frameworks, but it's also representing them in a sort of Afrofuturist or science fiction um, paradigm. But in doing so, again, as I mentioned, she's centering Africa. She's saying that these narratives of, of the future or narratives of saving the world or narratives of questioning you know, environmental degradation are not only relevant to Africa, but actually we can read them through Africa. So she's, in the words of Ngugi Wathiongo, she's moving the center and that center now is, in this novel, is Lagos, but as uh, Miriam spoke to, is other parts of the continent as well. So her, essentially, Okorofo's future is, is an African future. Okay, I'll end there. Thank you.
was incredibly interesting. Um, I like the, um, I was thinking a lot when you were speaking about how um, people link physical phenomena to the spiritual, to the spiritual or to other worldly things. And um, we'll get the, into this in the discussion, but one of the things that I always find interesting is how, um, is it the fact that people already do all these kind of imaginations in their day-to-day -day life that makes it um, difficult for people to imagine that sci-fi is possible in the African realm, in the sense that, um, at least I can think of in my experience, spiritualism has always been such a big part of, of our day-to-day -day life. Um, don't stand on one foot because you know, it's bad luck. That's a superstition that we have in my family, uh, in my community, rather. And um, I think, well, I'll save that for the discussion later, but I found that really, um, really fascinating. I'm gonna, um, our last speaker on this panel is Khadija. Khadija was introduced um, in great depth uh, yesterday. Um, Khadija George, um, AKA Khadija Sese, um, which is the name that she publishes uh, with is a literary activist, a project manager, and a founder of a festival in the Gambia called Mboke Festival. And I believe that the, the festival is going to be the thrust of her presentation today. So I just press that button. Yeah. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, okay. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm kind of going to do this slightly. I'm going to just play this bit of the video first, just so I can get it out of the way and I don't mix it up in the middle and get everything wrong. Um, so once you've watched this, just hold on to the thoughts till the end of the presentation. <laughs> Okay, uh, so this um, is about when Professor Ngugi Wationgo, he came to the Gambia in January for our, for our festival. And so I'm just going to play the first one and a half minutes. He belongs to the pre- and post-independent African writers with a pan-African mindset and ideology at variance with the norms and values of modern-day politics and political systems that denigrate African cultures when he touched down at the Banjo International Airport on Friday evening for the first time in the Smiling Coast after his invitation by the organizers of the Mboka Festival of Arts to participate in the festival. The professor of African literature did not mince his words when he described himself as Africa's language warrior. In every African country, which everybody should be able to speak their mother tongue, be able to write their mother tongue, you have to read their mother tongue. Then, if you don't know one or two other African languages within their own country, and then add English or French or any other language, okay? So we start with ours first. We go on adding, we become more powerful. But if you start with somebody else's, that's like being an outsider to your own house, right? Mm -hmm. All right, let me put this way. This is how I phrase it. Listen. If you know all the languages of the world and you don't know your mother tongue or the language of your culture, that is enslavement. His ideology as regard this resource rich continent. So I'll, I'll leave that there, but just hold on to that chapter thought. One, because I think... The language um, of African literature, oops, sorry. part one. Oh, okay. Because um, in terms of what has come out of the conference, from even from yesterday, and talking about language, and about how it's so important in our future, I thought that was an, an important um, bit to have. Thank you. I was going to do this on a loop, but maybe I'll just, I'll pretend I'm doing it on a loop. Um, so, um, I just need to do my, 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 my good fun D bit and thank Adept Stroke Afford for giving us the money to help us start off with this, um, to help us start off with the festival in terms of being like a civil society organization um, at the new dawn of Gambia. So thank you very much to Adept if they're here. Um, and I hope, Nangelo, you don't mind, I'll take a couple of extra minutes just to refer to some of the things that have come out from yesterday. Um, 
because one of the things that I think is important, I have to kind of actually, let me just kind of say why I, my, one of my mottos for Sable Publications is um, art is the heart of the nation. So that's in Gugi and Gambia. Maybe I'll go back to this. Um, art is the heart of the nation. And I, I kind of came to that after I was in um, Washington, D.C. in 2011. I got a... Um, I was one of the inaugural performance arts managers in that scholarship program at the Kennedy Center. And so, you know, we'd done all the introduction and we'd gone to all of these high-end events, all of these people, all this money, putting money into the Kennedy Center. So it was a really stush start. So we had our first meeting. There were 12 performance arts managers. And we had our first meeting in the restaurant right at the top of the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. I don't know if anybody's been to the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. It's really, and it's the only living memorial to a president in, in America. So we had just started the meeting, and 10 minutes into the meeting, somebody came running in from the kitchen and said, the Pentagon's on fire. And we were like, what? <laughs> um, and, um, and then the president of the Kennedy Center stood up and said, well, yes, they've hit New York. Um, and he'd been contacted by the Secret Service and said, you have to be on alert because you could be next, so we'll warn you. And so he basically said, everybody needs to leave the building right now. And thank goodness it was before 10 o'clock, so the public hadn't come in. And so for us who'd like just arrived, <laughs> this is just like, this is not what we came here for, <laughs> you know? And it was kind of like, that's what made me think, why on earth the Secret Service, one of the first things they did was contact the head of a, the National Arts Center to say, you could be next. Which made me then think, you know, they're hitting an arts center because art and culture is the center point. It's a, it's a heart of the nation. And the, the same way when, uh, when Ngugi came to, to the Gambia, and we're just talking to a Timbuktu bookshop, which is a purpose-built bookshop, one of the most beautiful bookshops I've been to. And he said, this is the soul of the Gambia. And he was just so pleased that we took him there. It was just almost by accident, because it, because it is. So I wanted to refer back, back to some of the discussions from yesterday in terms of talking about governance, in terms of talking about the future, because cultural practitioners um, and, and managers need to be included in the conversation when you're developing your nation, when you're, when you're raising a nation, and that is essential, and they're not always um, considered as entertainment. Culture is not, you know, it's not entertainment. It's, it's, it's the heart. It's, it's the heart of the nation. So we started Mboka Festival, not necessarily with that in mind, but that's what it came to, because then we happened to have it in January, and we happened to have it at the time when we were about to move the old president of 28 years out and bring a new one in. And people kept saying, you're not still going to have the festival, are you? And we said, well, of course we are. <laughs> you know, people are in the country. People expect the festival. We need to have the festival. People need to know that life carries on. We carry on. Art carries on. Art helps to nurture people. Art helps to move people onto this, uh, onto what we need. So um, it was essential that we, that we carried on. And I was kind of saw emails through other people thinking, we really feel sorry for Khadija and her group. This is going to be, you know, total washout, total failure. But it wasn't. It was great. It was successful. And it was really good that Professor Nguki Wationgo stayed throughout the whole thing, which is why... Here he is, celebrating with us. Gambia has decided. We had the Kenyan embassy call, call my colleague up and saying, we hear you've got Ngugi in the country. What are you doing with him? Where is he? We said he's safe. He's enjoying. He's having fun. He, this was the night, I think it was the night of the 18th, when Barrow had been um, sworn in in, in in Senegal. And, you know, he wasn't there, but Ngugi was. And he was enjoying with the young people <laughs> out on the town because they were all celebrating. So... There he is doing that. So this is, we did get so like some major support from leaders like Africel, and because of what was happening, we didn't actually get the banners out, but they look pretty good. <laughs> um, and, you know, in, in terms of promoting what was going on. And we just kind of really felt that in, in terms of moving into the future of the Gambia, that we made sure that the festival was a highlight and that the festival... Um, went forward. So basically there are three co-founders. We were all doing our own programs and we thought it just makes sense to come together. So the word Mboka is a Wolof word that actually means oneness, one people, oneness, one family. So it suited what we were going to do. 
And um, so one of the founders, he's um, uh, Professor, um, well, uh, Dr. Mamadou Saleh. He teaches at, um, he teaches at uh, De Montfort. And he's actually built a hub, like a creative hub in a village, Mandua village. And that's where we have our academic conference. And he also did the opening festival with arts and cultural activities from all over the Gambia, showcasing all the different arts and culture from all the different uh, groups within the Gambia. And there's myself doing the literature. Well, I wonder how you would have guessed that. I did the literature <laughs> and the book fair. And so we have a literary festival. I did the first one in 2005, and I'd always been, no, 2007, and I'd always been fighting to do another literature festival. So again, it, it came under Mboka. And the interesting thing about me doing the festival in 2007, I tell people this, some people laugh and some people are absolutely aghast, but um, there was the Dakar Pen Congress. There was a Pen Congress in Dakar, so I took some people to that. Um, I also did a retreat, a writer's retreat, and I did the literary festival. And somewhere in the middle of that, I got married. And the only thing that didn't survive was the marriage. <laughs> So my friend said, look, you just got married to the country. Just leave it at that, so it was true. Um, so, and then, and so, and the other, the third person, he's very key. He's based in the, uh, in the Gambia, and this is uh, Mr. Adam Abar, and his, um, his background is to do with tourism, responsible tourism. So it's kind of moving on from sustainable to being responsible. So it's not just about being sustainable, it's about being, being responsible. And he's one of the key people, I'd say, in Africa d uh, talking about responsible tourism. So it's really great to have him on board. Um, and that also then enables us, in terms of pushing that whole agenda, in terms of for cultural tourism, which is important for Gambia because it's so, so known for sun, sea, and sand. And we're saying we've got a lot more to offer. I'm saying we. I am Sierra Leonean, but I'm Gambian too. I'm a Pan-African. There we go. So, yeah, so uh, it's, it's very important to push that agenda. So the world travel market in November, we get a slot in that to say what we're doing. We made a call out for volunteers. We said we'd love some help because we've got no money. We'd like help. We had volunteers. The volunteers came. They paid for themselves. They came and we gave them this wonderful Gambia experience of working on the festival. Um, but then they also learned things through us and then we support people through other things and also giving training opportunities to young people in the Gambia. And there's also, there's a Gambian artist who's in Wales, and he's linking up with um, uh, young people, saying, do you need young people to come from Wales to come to the Gambia as volunteers? So they also have that learning and training experience. So there's so many different ways as part of being Mboka, and we hold on to that term, Mboka, of nurturing people in the country, nurturing young people in the country, but also in our surrounds. We've also linked up with festivals already in, Se in Senegal um, who are going to be part of that. And, and linking up with partners, you know, everywhere. I mean, we're linking up with uh, Numbi Arts in, in, in the UK. They're coming, they're having their retreat up at Sandele Echo Lodge, but they're also doing, going to be part of the festival. Um, and they're going to come, uh, come into town and do some of their work as part of the festival, and then we're going to take some people from the festival out of town back up to Sandele, which, which is a great place to do it. So we have all different um, aspects um, of, of, um, of what could be a festival in, in two weeks. So, for example, the literature festival obviously isn't the whole two weeks. We, we just take a, a, a section of that time. So there's different things going on at each time, so people can just experience not only Gambian culture and heritage, but um, we're fusing other African cultures and heritages in, in, into that as well. One of the things that I'm trying to do, for example, is trying to uh, work towards um, Gambia being a UNESCO city of literature. It could be a city of dance, it could have been a city of music, but that's not my thing. So since I'm working on it, it's going to be a city of literature. But we also feel that that's going to encourage literacy. It's going to encourage reading and writing. And as well, just take away from this thought that Gambia is only sun, sea and sand when there's so much more to offer. Um, so there's a couple of more things I was going to mention. Oh, going to, do I have any more slides? I don't think so. Oh, yeah. So there's Ngugi in the bookshop. And one of the things that he was really pleased about in the bookshop, he said as soon as he walked in, the first stands were African writers. You have Gambian writers on one side. We have all African writers on a stand on another side. And then you move in, and the European writers at the back. 
And he said, <laughs> and he said it's so different from when he was going into bookshops in South Africa when they would put all the other ones at the front. And he said that for him it was so important. So, and they've got a beautiful little space upstairs in terms of a coffee bar and everything. So it really is a, a wonderful space. Um, and as I said, it, it is purpose built. Um, I've mentioned all of those things. So, no, I think, I think that's enough. Um, and I think it's just, again, mentioning as going back to the video at the beginning, having, again, African languages at the center. I would really like to try and do a conference in 2019. We'll start a new festival, like a weekend festival of um, African poetry um, in translation. And, um, and as I said, as I showed people this yesterday, this is Nguga's story, The Upright Revolution, which is a children's story. But really, as a lot of children's stories are, they've got very good lessons for adults <laughs> um, in three Gambian languages. And we're going to try and do that for, for, for each guest of honor who we have. So we're also going to have, for example, this year, the Awari Society are coming, and they're going to set up in um, Gambia, they call the game Wari, but the Awari Society are going to come and they're going to set up a tournament and everything. So we're having lots of wonderful different aspects. We're having yoga, because I think yoga is very important for writers. So it's going to all be part of it as well. So um, yeah, and, and I, we, when we didn't have the yoga this time, because of course we had to cut out quite a few things, especially the outside sports, because it was going to be a little bit you know, sensitive, having the sport at, at, at that time, outside sports. And then I was getting emails afterwards saying what happened to the yoga. So I knew I had to get it sorted out this time, which we have, and wrestling matches, um, local wrestling matches and everything. So it's going to be very exciting. You're quite welcome to join us. I can give you a flyer um, if you want to come. It's January the 6th to the 20th, um, the festival's going to be. So please contact me afterwards if you want to know any more. Thank you. because I, I, I wanted to ask a question that I think unifies everything that we've, um, we've heard about uh, this morning. And that, the question is quite simple. Um, we, the, the theme of this panel was new visions, new images, new story. And so there's this underlying idea of newness. Um, but one thing that has come up, I think, a little bit in everything that we've heard is that what we consider new is actually building on a tradition that already exists, uh, either whether we're returning to uh, previous frameworks of language and language learning, whether we're thinking about storytelling in new ways and we're talking about you know, incorporating tradition into modern, quote unquote, modern festivals. Um, and so my, my, I guess my big broad question for the entire panel would be, um, in this pursuit of newness, as we go um, chasing this newness, what do we lose and what is worth um, um, saving, um, and what are we? Tr what should we be trying to protect as we're kind of chasing uh, newness? It's a big question, isn't it? <laughs> we didn't want to tell you, Angela, but when you sent us those questions, they were all big questions. We just thought, <laughs> gosh, if we just keep talking for more than ten minutes, we won't get to her difficult questions. We won't answer them. <laughs> Sorry. You caught me at a you caught me at a very profound. I was having a very profound <laughs> moment, so I had to ask about newness. Uh, well, I'm I'm asking simply because of um, this tension that I see with um, within sort of Af when we talk about quote unquote Africa, whatever that big word means. Um, there always seems to be a binary. Like we always have to seem to be have to decide whether we're moving in this direction or we're moving in this direction. Um, and you come to places, you come to SOAS, you know, you come to, to London and we're here in a building that's probably, what, 30, 40 years old and we cross the street and the building across the road is 70, 80, 100 years old and we go down to the British Museum and that building is, you know, a couple of, of decades old. And for, but then for us, there always seems to have to be this binary. And, but I, the sense that I got from what you're saying is that your work is existing in a space where you're trying to reconcile um, these two things. You know, is, is sci-fi new or is it, you know, folk tales being told in a different way. And so I guess what I'm really asking is if you can take a couple of minutes to reflect on 
um, what it is that you're building on and what it is that you're trying to protect and preserve in your work as you move forward kind of with, you know, quote unquote, newness or what are you encountering um, in your work rather? I don't know, I, in some ways I think just generally, I mean, as one of the, the phrases I think Louise said, there's nothing new underneath the sun. We're just, the story's already there. And I think it's just telling it in a, in, in a different way. The, the, like you said, there isn't new. It's just what, what ways, what are the existing and different resources that we can use to, 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 to tell our stories, since it, in a sense it is all stories, mm -hmm. to tell our stories. Um, and it might be new to the people in the West because they don't realise that we already have this. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, I kind of found it quite amusing when Barclays Bank talk, it started talking about a new app, we can now do our banking online. And this, I thought, yeah, we've been doing that in Africa for ages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because we have to. So it's just taking what is already there and adapting it to the way that we, that we need that we need to use it, mm. I think that's all it is. Really. Just to add to that, to the question, mm -hmm. um, I think it's about also finding a voice. Um, so, for example, I sort of referenced some of the uh, earlier texts in the Nigerian literary canon. Um, so a writer like Chinua Achebe, after him, you had quite a few writers who were sort of writing or trying to write the same style that he writes. So trying to sort of draw on the folklore and trying, trying to, well, not draw on the folklore, but sort of trying to frame a language in a particular way to sound like him, to use proverbs, to use, to use local imagery. And so some critics have sort of written disparagingly about kind of those, some of those that followed him of his generation. But it was about trying to find a language and a voice through which to tell particular story, tell their narrative. And I think that's what writers of each generation seek to do. So somebody like Nedia Korofa, who is very different to Achebe, didn't, you know, wasn't born at the sort of crossroads of history, wasn't, didn't ha doesn't have that immediate access to Igbo culture in the way that he did. Born in the US, grew up in Chicago, faced um, sort of racism in her youth and, you know, very much in sort of African-American circles, but also having access to <clears throat> Nigeria and traveling home on holidays and seeing family. So she is, she is interested in an African diasporic experience. She is interested in what's happening on the continent. And she is finding a framework through which to engage her own experience, but also the experience of her people as she envisions her people. So I think we find that different influences and experiences frame us in different ways and we engage in different ways. So in many ways, she is engaging in some of these older conversations. Um, but she's finding her own language and she's finding her own paradigms. And I think that's why she's been sort of influenced by kind of African-American experience of Afrofuturism, but very much thinking about Africa, the continent, and the future of Africa, the continent, mm -hmm. and marrying the two. So I don't know if it's necessarily a kind of a conscious, how can I be different? It's more, how can I find a paradigm that fits my own experience and how can I engage and how do I find the language to engage? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where her work is going, at least. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. I wanted to ask about language also, um, John and Judy especially. Um, um, Judy, a lot of the films that DocuBox does are in English. Um, no? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, the question is about uh, language. Do you think it's possible for people to um, tell quote unquote authentic, and I hate this word authentic because it's obviously very loaded, but um, in the context of stories that represent who they think they are accurately in a language that's not their own? Like, do you think it's possible to have an authentic, quote unquote, African experience in English? Um, I, th I think people become who they really are when they speak in the language that they dream in and think in. Um, I remember my father talking about with great surprise when he sort of got to 65 and he said, you know, gosh, I've just realized I've just begun to dream in English. And that really took him aback because his whole life he dreamt in Kikuyu. Yeah. Um, you know, for myself, who's, who's grown up in so many different places, this is always such a, a guilty debate in my head because I'm not great at, at my you know, local languages. I understand them, I speak them badly. <laughs> um, but if you look at almost all my films, you know, be it Kill a Necklace, which is in Sheng, Something Necessary, which is in Kikuyu, Kalenjin, and, and Swahili, um, the, the docu-box films, you know, I, with all filmmakers, we insist the subjects that you're following, let them speak in the language that they 
dream in the language that they are. One, one thing I found also as a fictional filmmaker, you can hear it when you cast and when you're reading lines, you know, lines written in English come out very stiffly, mm. pass me the wine tears, <laughs> you know, and then you ask people, take that and make it your own. You know what, if this doesn't work, throw it out. What would you say in this scenario? And immediately, um, the, 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 the actor becomes more authentic, the script becomes more authentic. You, you're not trying to mimic something, you're trying to pull out what already exists. Uh, so for me, I think language is incredibly important. Um, and yeah, it mimics who we are. And, and just to refer to the earlier question that, that you had, uh, because I think it ties in somehow, I think in this effort to chase the new, we forget the f foundation building. Mm -hmm. um, we forget to ask those very basic important questions. You know, as, as filmmakers, storytellers, we're running after what's happening online. What about the VOD platforms? What about the new DSLR cameras? What about, how, you know, how, we, we need to tell our stories quickly, but, but we're not, you know, spending the real foundational time asking these sorts of important questions. What language is, should we tell our stories in um, before we shoot them? C c let's spend some time understanding these tools that we didn't invent, you know, lenses and, and, and so on. So, yeah. <laughs> um, just to respond briefly to both of those questions, really. I mean, and picking up on the theme of yesterday that really we're talking about sort of pl plurilingual uh, re 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 realities here rather than, um, you know, writers or filmmakers, artists having to choose a particular language. So, so it's back to this notion of how, how do we perceive of language in the real world uh, and, and possibly not separate bounded entities, mm. but, you know, there's a huge amount of code switching, translanguaging going, go, goes on, I think, you know, mm. <laughs> um, that um, uh, uh, is appropriate, I think, to, to, to be captured in, mm. in those different texts and so on. So I'd like to think that it's possible to, to mix and to match those different um, languages within particular um, you mm. know, artistic sort of um, products. Um, referring to the first question, I'm looking at that through the sort of the educational lens and lens of government and society, I think um, there are some very important drivers going on. The whole global globalization process reference was made yesterday to governments having their vision 2020s or 2025, 2030s, very much within a, um, a neoliberal economic and political paradigm. And what I think what I've, the real downsides of that is that it actually does start to close down the space for the local Mm -hmm. um, you know, local languages, local cultures, and so on. And so I think that is an enormous challenge um, insofar as, you know, Western sort of liberal notions um, and, and models uh, pre predominate in, in, in that space. Um, I, I'd just like to point to one or two um, really interesting examples of how that is actually being um, countered in some ways. Looking through, uh, some people will be aware of the enormous amount of investment that's being made um, in early grade reading in formal education in Africa and a focus on technical reading skills, almost to the exclusion of the oral, the oral tradition mm -hmm. and, and the devaluing of that. Um, there's some very interesting activities going on in South Africa, um, the, the Nali Bali project, which is a community-based project. So it's actually taking um, language and um, literacy out of the formal education space where it's very closed down into the community and back into the oral traditions and, and using new technology to capture some of those stories and I interactive experiences between adults and, and, and children. And so I think there are opportunities to reclaim that space and to redefine uh, the local, both mm -hmm. in language and literacy, but you know, let's not underestimate the, <laughs> the powerful nature of the forces, uh, you know, operating in different, um, in very different directions. Um, to to add to what um, is that? Yeah. To, to what um, Luisa said, and um, coming back to the to the newness of things, I think it's also a question of um, not only finding a voice, but also and building a foundation, but also making something audible and visible, mm. what is already there. I think Western publishing filters have done uh, a job in suppressing stories that have been there, and it's, it's also a question of how, how we read a story. As Luisa said, 
um, we can read Things Fall Apart as a science fiction story, mm -hmm. but nobody's done that mm -hmm. so far. And, and now we as, as literary critics cannot deny that existence of, mm -hmm. a, of African science fiction anymore, which has been there before. Mm -hmm. but, um, so yeah, I think the, 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 the digital era now um, gives us a lot of possibilities mm -hmm. to, to, to make these stories visible. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are a lot of literary um, collectives forming online mm. and um, um, diminishing the power of the Western p publishing filter. So, so there's a lot happening now that might have happened earlier with, if the means would have been there. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, open up to the floor. Do we have a floor mic? Um, let's kind of work our way up. Um, so we'll start here, and then here, and then here. We'll take three questions at a time. Thank you for this one. Is it? Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this beautiful panel around voices, alienation, exclusion, inclusion, visibility, audibility. And picking up several strands, this linguistic alienation and pain, mm. and... Uh, the reminder of the Emir of Kanu that we should not forget what existed before colonization and whether we have African solutions to problems that are maybe not African problems but imported problems. The standard language cultures that rely on the selection of particular standard languages, each with their own standardized orthography that intend to draw boundaries around languages, is a European solution. And there exist African solutions to manage multilingualism, including in writing, that are very fluid and much more monolingual, so-called lead language writing traditions that use the language of first literacy, for instance, Arabic for many Muslims, and these days uh, the Roman script for many Christians, and write all languages across board with the same conventions. This is not standardized, it's a very soft conventionalized, conventionalized system. It has huge literary traditions in the Adyami writing practice, mm. and it exists in grassroots writing practices across Africa in modern forms of writing, digital writing, and social media, text messages. I, I don't know any single African who does not practice this form of writing, but it's discounted, and it's a very flexible plurilingual solution that comes directly from the lived experience of African readers and writers. Mm. I think that is a very promising avenue to pursue, to have a real inclusivity mm. also in writing in, and in plurilingual classrooms. Excellent. Um, as we're waiting for the mic to travel, um, I think there was a poet or a writer, someone who said, maybe it's time we need to, to stop thinking about English and start thinking about Englishes and how different people are, are using the language in different ways. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, I really enjoyed the presentations. My question was that quite a lot has been said about um, interpreting some books that have been written over half a century ago and that are standalone classics um, as, how, as being somehow science fiction. And I just wondered, what is the actual value of that? Because these books are standalone classics on their own. They're very interesting. Everybody's enjoyed them. What is the value of reinterpreting them in this genre? I, I didn't really get the point, and mm. I just wanted to understand that a bit more. Okay, and we'll take the third one, and then we'll let you respond. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, a wonderful presentation. Uh, I've really been wondering, um, actually Jude has answered the part of my question uh, already after uh, the, the chair asked uh, the question to the panel. I was wondering the fluence really uh, of English that are uh, the African looking uh, presenters uh, use. And I really wonder whether they, I, I really wondered whether they actually um, speak so fluently in their local languages back home, whether they would actually express that kind of fluence in thought and, you know, in their languages. But Jude, I think, has confessed. Um, <laughs> yes. The, the other thing I would like to say is, uh, um, 
I really wish SOAS could be training uh, scholars of this caliber for Africa. Uh, unfortunately, I am a little bit scared that perhaps uh, quite a number of these remain in Europe. Mm -hmm. I'm scared about that. Yeah, I, I think something that you may need to comment. Now, my question is, um, uh, I would like somebody who may be politically oriented to connect the relationship between politics and language and in the context of Africa. I really feel that it may not really be the issue of resources that inhibit the promotion of African languages in the classroom, but perhaps there is a hidden agenda in terms of power and politics. Mm -hmm. Please kindly dismember that for us. Okay, um, we'll have to stop there. Um, so we've taken uh, comments on the standardization. Um, I think that uh, perhaps uh, Louise and Miriam, you could respond to the question about reinterpreting things fall apart, reinterpreting classical texts. Uh, John, Judy, Khadija, if you could respond to the idea of language and politics, language as politics, as you, as you find it in the work that, you, that you're doing, if that's all right. Um, so if we start with the things fall apart question. Thank you for that question. Um, so there's two things I'd say. One of them is as readers, we always bring something to the text. We all read texts in different ways. We all interpret texts in different ways. Um, one thing that I think is particularly interesting about Nedia Korofor is the way in which she sees the world. So beyond her writing, if anybody follows her on Facebook or I don't know if she's on Instagram or she's Twitter. On Twitter. She's, she's on Instagram. She's on Facebook. She's on Facebook all the time. <laughs> and Twitter you see, all the time. Sorry, <laughs> that's not a bad thing. Um, but, she, but she's constantly taking photos. She travels the world a lot, and she's constantly taking photos. And um, so I've seen photos of her, of, of hers, like I think when she's been in possibly Japan and taking photos of sort of strange jellyfish and she finds all these interests, she loves insects, she finds all these interesting insects that I've never seen before and takes photos of them. And I must say many, and sort of fish and all sorts of things. And I must say just through looking at literally the lens through which she sees the world, she's sort of <laughs> collating all these strange creatures and images that are very much of this world, but kind of have a sort of science fiction <laughs> element to them and it and it makes just through seeing that I can understand how she engages and how, and why she writes the kind of work that she writes and she says that she's not writing fantasy for fantasy's sake that this is actually organic that this is coming from her so I think likewise the quote I, I sort of showed um, from her where she's talking about reading things fall apart I think it's her own engagement with the novel and it makes sense to her in on those terms and she writes in that framework. So I think it's partly about our own experiences and what we can take from texts and how we engage with texts. It doesn't mean that that should be the only reading or the primary reading, but that's part of what literary criticism is. It's finding new ways to engage with, with works. And having a plurality of readings doesn't diminish other readings. It just means we have we have a, a plethora available to us. We can engage in different ways and we can all take from text in different ways. So it's more expanding rather than a kind of reduction or taking away from, and that's how I see it. Hmm. Well said. Um, um, I think if we deny the continent, the genre of Africans, of, of science fiction, then we also deny the continent, uh, the future in Hegelian fashion. Um, and as Luisa said, um, to read a novel only in the framework of the post-colonial African novel comes with a framework of, of concepts and themes that we apply to that novel. And if we would continue to, to analyze um, African literature as we, as we did the last, like the, with the the, the literature that emerged after independence and the fashion of things fall apart, um, then we limit ourselves to, to, a f to a set of concepts like the West versus Africa and the, the writing back fashion and, um, and to, to look at literature through the, the, through the lens of science fiction also means to open up this, this framework um, that we apply for the analysis, I think. Mm. Yeah. Well said. Language and politics. 
<laughs> Googie's favorite subject. Yeah, one, one could discourse on this uh, for the rest of the day, I'm sure. Um, but trying to keep it relatively short. Um, I think the political economy of language, um, certainly as it links to um, education, is a particularly under-investigated um, area of research and, and needs much more attention. Um, we've had one or two interesting examples of that in recent years, and, and I think what they've pointed up is um, how uh, you can have a very kind of uh, powerful uh, alliance of, of myth, if you like. There are certain myths, I think, around um, European languages in terms of, you know, um, what they can buy or gateways to success and all kinds of things. Um, and those myths and perceptions, you know, actually are still actually still quite strong. Um, now, uh, that links, if you like, parents and communities to, to politicians in the sense that, and Malawi, actually a neighboring country of um, Zambia is a good example of this in the um, run up to the last um, you know, uh, national elections where the government uh, actually uh, made a pledge to the electorate that they would bring forward the introduction of English medium education from, from P4, primary four. So there had been policy of um, permitting um, local languages uh, to, to be language of learning and teaching in the early years. They said, it's not working, so we're gonna bring it forward to, to P1. We're going to introduce it from uh, the very beginning. And from a, a, an educational perspective, that's quite a disastrous um, decision uh, to, 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 to make because we know the um, very negative consequences of that. And the British Association of Applied Linguistics actually wrote to the then government of Malawi requesting them to review this uh, and withdraw it as an election pledge. Um, but I think what that points out really is, is there, there's a certain sort of short-termism amongst governments and politicians, and, and, and language actually even comes into play in terms of being used as a ploy uh, to gain votes. Uh, so that's something that we're very much aware of. Um, so much longer term, and, and this is the challenge, how do we uh, focus governments you know, on, on, on you know, uh, shifting from quite disastrous language in education policies to ones which are much more uh, productive and beneficial in terms of learning outcomes and that are actually focused on pedagogic solutions rather than political <laughs> uh, and, and so on. So I think the, that struggle continues. Uh, we're learning from you know, uh, some of the recent sort of episodes, um, um, but it's, uh, as I say, very, uh, I think we need a much stronger focus, a much stronger lens, both academic and research on that, to draw out some of, as you say, it's not purely about resources, it's about the political will, it's about short-termism, it's about sort of governments looking for votes and, and cashing in what they see as very popular uh, choices amongst parents, but which are actually uh, based on myth rather than uh, re, 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 any sense of re, 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 reality. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, I guess I'm trying to figure out how to answer this question because there's so many ways. And so I'll do the thing I can only do best and, and answer it through um, stories of characters. I remember my grandfather, my mother's father. Um, you know, he was employed for the first time just before independence, did the cut to the hair that made you feel like your hair was flowing <laughs> to the side, like, you know, like a European. And, and it, it wasn't. And, and he did another thing. He very fastidiously studied his dictionary. Mm. He would sit down, open that dictionary, and you never met a man who, who knew as many English words as he did. And, and he went very rapidly up the line at the Kenya Railways, which is East African Railways, which is, oh, maybe they knew each other, where, where he worked. Um, and that was the fashion, I think, of the 60s and the 70s, was to speak in that kind of way, to show that you were advanced and better than everybody else by, by, by speaking this. And, 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 and power would respond to you by promoting you and so on. Enter the 80s when you know, Daniel Arab Moy comes in, um, our second president, and it just became a thing at national... Um, Independence Days and so on, he would read the official English speech with all the, the ambassadors and emissaries and 
everyone behind him and it was always about progress and the mm -hmm. future. And the then he would throw that thing away and he would say what was really on his mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the ambassadors and the foreign missions would not have a clue mm -hmm. that half of it was was insulting them who think they, you know, and, and people, the, the audiences and the crowd, the state would respond to that. Um, I think today is yet another step in, in that direction. Um, in, in, in the 90s, if you, as a musician, took your, your, your music to a national station, they, it would have to be English or Swahili or a certain, you couldn't mix it. It was as if we were schizophrenic and we didn't know who to be. Mm. You know, am I my dad dreaming in my local languages? Have I converted? Am I, what am I? You know, and there was a lot of schizophrenia and in the way that power responded to, to even the fact that people speak by speaking more than la one language in a sentence. Um, today, for the first time, you have uh, musicians who are stars, who, who, who sing completely in, in local, superstars who sing completely in local languages. This was disdained and looked down on in the 70s. Um, and, and, and therefore you see power res responding appropriately. Yes. You know, the, the politicians, rather than feeling the need to, to please crowds in certain ways, are, are able to, to embrace and encourage um, local language in a way that we didn't see in the decades that preceded. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but, um, mm. but I think just that trajectory has been so interesting the, and the way that, that um, we have wielded um, English either you know, as a tool to, 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 to show power and now that is really beginning to turn, especially with people in 20s and 30s, in, yeah, in their 20s, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, um, if you don't mind, a quick on two on, on both of those questions, just two quick points. Because I was working with a lot of African writers in England in the 90s around African science fiction and Afrofuturism. But in fact, we put we conflate we didn't necessarily conflate them, but we put them all under one term of um, speculative fiction, African science fiction, fantasy, um, Afrofuturism. We call we just called it speculative fiction. And when we were talking to writers about it, it's like, well, we've always had speculative fiction. It's not new. So kind of applying the term, even science fiction, to African literature to say, why are we looking at it differently? We're not. That's just, again, the Western term of, of what we already had. When you're talking about the old man on the street and I look behind and he'd gone. We have that in African literature all the time. We don't call it science fiction. It's just our story. And, that, and, that's, and that's as simple as, as the way it is. And that's what is interesting now, that we're applying these terms to it. But like Nedi does and everything, we've, we've, we've kind of always, always had it. So it's just using different terminology for what we already had. So it comes back again to that newness thing. Mm -hmm. It's not new. Mm. Yeah. In terms of the question around um, politics and, um, and language, I must admit, I'm not 100% sure what you're asking about there, because for me, I don't split things like politics and art. I, it's to me because art, art is political, mm. I, and I and I don't split them. So I'm, I'm I'm sorry. So I didn't. It was partly not 100% listening properly, and partly because <laughs> I don't think I can. That whole thing around po language and politics. It is it's so. There's such big things that, and I and I'm, I must admit I don't necessarily consider them as separate because I just feel that, every, even the work in terms of what I do. It's, it's, it's political on, on an artistic level because, it, because it, it just is. And you know, and we know that politicians just use things like language as, 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 a, as a power thing to, they can use it to divide and they can use it to bring together. And we just need to use it more to bring together. Thank you. Um, you're going to get mad at me because I'm not gonna take any more questions. <laughs> and the reason I'm not taking any more questions is because I think the panel after this has been moved up and I would like, very much like for you to have lunch. Um, I think it's an important part of the day. Um, I'd like to invite you to please come up and speak to the panelists um, after this panel if you have any questions that you would like to put to them specifically. Um, otherwise, a leaflet on yes, um, two things. There are some leaflets up here on DocuBox and we have a couple of copies of Scarred, the movie that I talked about, um, they're on sale. Um, please only buy it if you are going to also make a commitment to show it to your friends. Don't just hide it on your shelf. 
And the reason I say this is because this is really one of the most powerful films to have come out of Kenya in the last, I would say easily in the last 20 years, maybe if not more. And um, I don't, I don't buy it and hide it on your DVD collection. Hide it and sh buy it and show it to your friends. Um, so please come up um, if you're interested in any of those two things. Otherwise, thank you so much for your attention. Um, enjoy your lunch. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in the afternoon. Thank you.